Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Flack. I'm the sector lead for new builds and planning here at Neighbours. I'd just like to welcome you to today's final session for uh, building energy in our Neighbours Energy Modelling Workshop Series. Um, and I just allow a couple more minutes just to welcome you all in uh, to the Zoom room. And before we kick off, uh, just some general housekeeping today will be um, recorded and you'll be able to view this session uh, following uh, on our YouTube channel. And when you would like to make a question today, please <clears throat> use the Q&A function of the Zoom and we should be able to um, use that to um, ask any questions you have throughout the webinar series. So if we'll go on to the next slide, uh, we'd just like to kick off by acknowledging the tradition uh, and welcoming our other two panelists today. I'm joined by G.S. Rao and P.C. Thomas, both from Team Catalyst, um, both are very um, experienced practitioners um, and both are on our Neighbours Independent Design Review panel. Um, so I will hand over to them in a, a minute um, before um, to kick off the more formal parts of the presentation, but we go to the next slide as well to uh, just do a quick acknowledgement of country as well. So. I'd like to pay uh, my respects to and acknowledge any uh, Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, that are first peoples and the traditional custodians of Australia. And we pay respect to elders past and present and those that are joining us today at this session. So without further ado, um, I'll pass over to uh, GS and PC to present and then following the presentation we'll have around 15 minutes to have a bit of a question and answer so um, please put, pop in your questions as we go through and I'll make sure to that we're, um, we'll have enough time following the session to answer everything so get them in there and I'll have it, hand over to you PC. Thanks Ryan so uh... So GS and I are gonna do this presentation and we'll try and speed through it reasonably quickly so we've got questions at the end. Okay, so um, this is some housekeeping. Hopefully you guys have um, got this under control. Now, just a quick agenda. We're gonna do two slides to quickly review what we've done, then address the main subject, which is what are the gaps between a neighbor's model and a JV3 model. Look at what sorts of inputs uh, we might have to think about, how we represent air conditioning systems, which is really quite a big deal, and then some questions and answers. So we saw this slide last time. We are looking at building a simulation model to estimate neighbors. Um, you already know that. We discussed this in, I think it was in the, the second uh, webinar. These are all the parts of the uh, energy simulation model. If you go back and look at that, you can refresh, but essentially these are all the bits that we're looking at. And let's start looking at what are these gaps. So, when you build a JV3 model, you may not have all the systems that consume energy within your model. So when you're doing the neighbor's uh, model, you're trying to estimate the total energy use for the building from, if it's a base case, then from the landlord side, or if it's a whole building rating, then for both tenant and uh, base building. Typically, if you're doing a commitment agreement, you're looking at the base building. Now, some of these systems need to be estimated uh, using other methods. Their energy consumption needs to be estimated 
using other methods. And because you're trying to predict what the meter will be reading, you want to ensure that the inputs for the model are practical and that they are quite robust in that if your assumptions were changed a little bit, you don't see a huge change in the energy simulation numbers. And particularly, this is quite a big topic. The building services, air conditioning systems, domestic hot water systems, lift systems, must be correctly analyzed. And the HVAC system is the one climate dependent system. That's why you need simulation more than anything else. There are limitations to what the energy simulation can program. You need to be aware of that, need to account for that. Some things are not simulated very well, other things are. So you need to just keep that in mind and then decide how you are modeling. So I wanted to give you um, two views. This is the view of a base building that we worked on some time ago. And this is the actual meter data that came out of the submetering that was put into the building. You can see here that the chilled water plant is almost 60%. The HU fans are another 14, 15%. So we're already getting to about 75% of the base building energy use um, in this building. Now, admittedly, this was not a particularly efficient building. Okay. You can see the light and power for common areas is 21% here. But when you do a simulation, it'll be a bit different from when you do metering. You can represent each of the subsystems and what they use in finer grain. And what you need to be able to do for a neighbor's rating, obviously, is you've got to be able to match the two up. So if you look at the pie on the right, if you add up from chillers, chill water pumps, all the way down to split systems, you can see that in this case, it's about 55% of the pie. But on the left, it's 75% of the pie. The meter data for that building shows that about 75% of the energy used for the base building was for air conditioning system. Older building, less efficient. The one on the right, estimated using energy simulation and other methods, more efficient, aiming for five and a half stars. You can see the pie changes quite a lot. But you want to make sure that whatever you simulate can be measured in the same way so you can compare. That allows you then to take corrective action if any particular system suddenly starts to be using two or three times the energy that you predicted it would use. Now, what are the systems that are other than the main air conditioning system? Common area lighting, staircases, car parks, loading docks, etc. You need to be able to estimate that all kinds of miscellaneous ventilation systems, toilets, car parks, lift motor rooms, garbage rooms, kitchens. We need to have a handle on uh, how many fans there are, what their rating is, how many hours they're running to try and estimate what is the energy use. Vertical transport, lifts, goods lifts, escalators, car park lifts, and also how they fit in with the neighbor's accounting rules. Where does the energy get split? Okay, hydraulic systems, pumping, rainwater tanks, recycled water, all these other systems that are on the screen here. Where do they use energy? Okay, domestic hot water systems or toilets, end of trip kitchens, etc etc. Some others, okay, auxiliary air conditioning systems, so small systems for the security manager, the building manager, a garbage room, an end of trip facility. They may not be linked to the main air conditioning system of the building 
they may be different. You may have to do estimates more than simulations for these. Energy use for the jacket heating of a diesel generator. Okay. Other systems that are specifically designed for tenant usage, tenant outside air systems, can, tenant condenser water systems. Again, um, somewhat difficult to model within an energy simulation program. You might need to use some spreadsheets to work out what those numbers are. On-site renewable energy systems, um, PV systems generally, and to remember that only the portion that is generated and used on site can be accounted for in your neighbor's rating. Okay. So these systems may, as I said, may be difficult to input into the main simulation model. So you may need other methods, okay? And the important thing to remember is that these systems can account for more than half the energy consumption attributable to, uh, in this uh, base building office <clears throat> case. Other buildings may have different proportions. Uh, these calculation methods are not particularly precise. You are guesstimating. Most of that guesstimate is based on how you think these, these systems will be used by occupants in the building. So it's always good to go back and talk to the design team, talk to the owner and developer, figure out how you think they feel the building will be used. If they've got buildings of the same type already, it might be good to go back and see how energy is be, being used in these in those buildings and then try and apply it to your case. Okay. Um, I covered that. Calibrate data from similar buildings if it's available. Okay. You'll find that in some buildings you may have shared services. If you've got a commercial building tower and a residential tower sharing the same car park basement, then you need to think about how you can monitor that and split it for neighbors accounting. So that's not really simulation, but that is trying to figure out what goes into your neighbor's energy budget. Now, if you start looking at the inputs that go into the model, you start from the building fabric side, you do want to use realistic numbers for everything. So when you're talking about R values or U values, you do need to think that there is going to be some bridging. That bridging is going to reduce the performance and you need to account for that in your energy simulation. It's no longer about compliance. This is about what will really come out of the meter when you um, do the simulation. So I've shown you a picture of a construction on the left and a window window frame on the right. This is an interesting one. Take, for example, occupancy patterns. These are all your internal loads, your lighting equipment, people, fresh air. If you just look at occupancy or people, right, your design number, 100% occupancy, is 10 meters squared per person. Each person, you have a designed heat load. That heat load will translate into energy that an HVAC system would use to keep a space in comfort conditions. Okay. If you look at the NCC schedules, they realize that while you might have designed for 10 meters squared per person, Typically, only about 70% of that population would be in a space on most days. And that's what they've asked us to use for the energy calculation. Now, is that the right number to use for your project? You need to think about that. Okay? Weekend usage would be very different from weekday usage, but there would be some. How do you account for that? 
behavior in your model when you're trying to predict reality. Uh, it's particularly true in the occupancy um, systems, the people systems. It's probably less true for lighting and equipment because we don't generally have too much data. So we are using um, lighting numbers from the code. Equipment numbers is always a bit of a guess. If you have a space where people are using two or three monitors, you may want to think about how the equipment is used compared to another space where people only have laptops that they are using. Okay. Let's talk about the how one might represent an air conditioning system. Okay. This is, I guess, the Rolls Royce of air conditioning systems. Down on the left-hand side, on the bottom, you have the condition zone, okay, the condition space, if you will, which is just here. Now, to be able to cool and heat the space, you have all these other loops. So there's an air loop, a chilled water loop, a refrigerant loop, and a heat rejection loop. Okay. Um, each of those has got components. So there's a fan that supplies the air loop. There's some air that's exhausted that is brought in as fresh air or outside air, and the process is repeated all the time. The cooling coil is made cold by a chiller. The chiller that produces chilled water, the chilled water is pumped around the loop there. And then you have these four components, the evaporator, the condenser, the compressor, and the expansion valve that form the chiller. That one component, the chiller, is made up of these four parts. Obviously, that all happens within the chiller. And then as it's providing cold water, it is doing work, it is getting warm. The heat that it's extracting from the zone gets passed into the condenser. The condenser then, if it's an air-cooled condenser, obviously there's a fan blowing across some coils. If it's a water-cooled condenser, it looks like this. You have a cooling tower in the heat rejection circuit. And basically that's a shower that you are using to um, to dump the heat into the atmosphere. So you pull it from the condition space, you dump it out to the atmosphere using the cooling tower. Okay. So you're thinking about your system and how it's modeled within the simulation program. What are the things that you can control with it? Okay. You need to represent each of these components correctly. So here is the data that we require in Energy Plus to derive a three-dimensional curve, part load curve for a chiller. In this case, water cool chiller. But there's quite a lot of data. You need to go after them. If you're using particular kinds of chillers, you might need to go back to the manufacturer, reach out from them and get this data. It's not always easy to get. So in the three parts, you're getting on the left-hand side, performance and design conditions. Then you're getting data for different um, chilled water outcomes. And then finally, you're getting part load data, which allows you that if you take these three sets of things, you can combine them into a series of equations that will give you part load at all operating conditions. Okay. If you're doing a direct expansion system, it's the same kind of thing. In this case, you have an outdoor unit, a condenser unit, you have mixing box, BC controller as it's called there, and VRF systems um, always talk about the fact that they can simultaneously do heating and cooling. However, it's good to remember that the simultaneous heating and cooling requirement is actually there for a very small fraction of the year. Most of the time you're doing just cooling or just heating. And that's the performance that you really should be interested in, not in the combined performance, which shows some very high COP values. Air cool systems are the same as water cool systems. You also need part load performance data. Here is what 
uh, a very common um, representation of that is. Depends a lot on ambient temperature and indoor temperature and uh, what capacity you're using. You need those kinds of definitions for all the components, okay? Um, cooling tires, condensing units, fans, pumps. You're looking for part load operational data and full load operational data for each of these systems. And obviously your model needs to be able to control that. When you talk about air conditioning systems, there are many, a myriad kind of systems. You might have fully centralized systems. You might have um, chill water systems or direct expansion systems. Your air side could be VAV boxes, active chill beams, passive chill beams, underfloor air distribution boxes. You may have combinations of that. Quite a popular combination is a, um, active chill beams on the perimeter and VAV boxes in the center zones or some other combinations. You may have heat exchangers. So if you've got a chill beam system, you have a requirement for low temperature chilled water and high temperature chilled water. You might have one chilled water set and then a heat exchanger to control those temperatures. So you need to model many of those things. How does your fresh air, your outside air system work? Is it a full fresh air system? Is there an economy cycle? How is that controlled? In your plant room, if you've got multiple pieces, multiple chillers, how do you control that? Got a series of outdoor condensing units for a direct expansion system. How do you deal with that? Okay. Here's a representation of an underfloor air system for the zone side. Okay. Here's a representation for a multiple chiller plant room. So how do you control these systems? So the graph on the right-hand side shows how you would use uh, the low load chiller as a swing chiller that keeps coming in and out where, uh, of duty as it's required. Your model needs to be aligned with the, the functional description for the BMS system for the real building. So the control systems that you model in your uh, building energy simulation uh, program needs to represent this functional uh, description quite clearly and accurately. You really do need to think about what is the level of accuracy of your sensor? What can it resolve? There isn't much point in trying to set a control strategy where 0.25 change in space temperature results in a 10 or 15%, 15 degree change in air flow rates or water flow rates. It really isn't going to happen because most sensors, um, the accuracy of most sensors is around 0.3 degrees centigrade at best. Okay. So you need to think about realistic um, control strategies to do that. Then they, I've listed a series of points here which you really need to think about. Most modelers would need to think about this. What are your practical limitations for flow rates and temperature set points? What is a practical limit to a supply air temperature reset, for example? If you reset the temperature to be too high, you lose dehumidification capacity at the coil. We don't generally dehumidify actively, but we should be doing it because as the planet warms, we are going to see much more humidity in the air. We're already seeing that in Sydney. We have many days where air temperatures are not too high, but humidities are, relative humidities are quite high. And GS always likes to point out these things when we are doing reviews. What are limited... I, I think BC... Go ahead. BC, to add to, add to that, uh, I, I would say that uh, these practical limitations that has been listed out, they are actually the weakest link in an energy simulation model. Because if these things are not considered, uh, you know, you're going to get a, an optimistic result or an unrealistic prediction of how the system is actually going to perform. And as PC mentioned, supplier temperature reset is a very common uh, situation where high 
supplier resets are considered, especially in in, uh, in weather conditions where the humidity is high, and and not to mention even Sydney conditions are quite high. When the dry bulb temperature is low, we've got a lot of moisture in the air, and you need to have the dehumidification. And one of the aspects in 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 Australia is there is no specification that actually is details humidity control especially for commercial office buildings and that can be an issue with practical operation energy consumption and thermal comfort in the space uh, and the limitation on chilled water and condensed water resets now that's a that's again a practical aspect that needs to be considered in terms of how does your actual system cope with those reset conditions for example if you have a high chill water reset and a low condensed water temperature your chiller may not be able to operate under those conditions because it needs a minimum differential pressure. So these are things that will need to be considered looking at what the actual limitation of the plant is specific to that building, and then consider that in the model to have realistic chill water and condenser water reset temperatures. Okay. Then uh, minimum flow set point again, I mean, chill, each chiller manufacturer will tell you what's the minimum flow rate that is required in terms of making sure that the chiller can operate in a stable manner. So you may not be able to actually turn down the flow rate to what is considered in the model because the chiller may not be able to operate under those conditions. So essentially, it is question of making consistency between the limitation of the system to what you are considering in the model. Because don't forget that you're you're now doing the model for predicting actual performance. It's it's not just a tick box. So you're trying to mirror how this performance is going to be in real life, and you're going to model that those in. And then chiller sequencing, which uh, which we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, practical aspects related to chiller sequencing, uh, depending upon. The number of chillers uh, or, or the number of systems that are, that has been uh, represented to actually cool the space and how the sequencing arrangement is going to be implemented online in terms of uh, you know the functional description in terms of the actual limitation of the chillers as well. Then the th then the, the next aspect is is of critical importance in terms of the limitations imposed by index runs. And uh, one of the aspects that we have seen very, very frequently is looking at prediction of fan energy and pump energy based on just using fan and pump curves. The energy input or the energy consumption, which is, a, uh, which is directly driven by the power input based on the operating condition, really depends upon what is your minimum fan turned down and your pump turned down. However, you got to look at, has the fan enough grunt to push through the index run for the air quantity? Has your pump got enough KPA pressure to push it to the last fan coil unit or AHU? So if you just consider the fan curve or the pump curve without considering the system curve, then what's happening is you will not be considering the power input based on satisfying the, the low flow situation uh, during part load conditions. And that's where uh, there is a huge uh, gap between the estimated energy use, especially during part load conditions. You could underestimate the energy use during low load and part load conditions. And a typical example is after hours servicing during, uh, you know, a multi-storied building that requires just a couple of floors of air conditioning, and your fan may may be able to turn down even up to fifteen percent or twenty percent, but you got to consider the fan input power to satisfy the index run, and that's a different situation. So you may have to limit the actual power input of the fan to consider that, or the pump as it may be. So these are all things that that can really impact, uh, you know, the energy uh, prediction in terms of also the practical limitation of temperature set points and flow rates. 
uh, and as as uh, as PC mentioned earlier, in terms of how your control your sensors and the accuracy of your sensors, does it show consistency with your actual set point uh, and dead band control? And these are some of the important aspects that uh, I, I just wanted to highlight, which we feel that are the weakest link in the energy simulation. That's correct. And yeah. you know, not considering the PC or yeah. will give you, you know, fantastic looking results, which obviously yeah. would not be possible to achieve in, in practice. Um if we keep going, some of the things that are that you want to think about is if you're using an extremely old weather data file. We know climate change is happening, and uh, you know the, um, we are getting warmer summers. So you'd be better off trying to get a recent data file. Not necessarily a future weather file because future weather files kind of wipe out um, heating and we will have heating for hopefully the next two, three decades. Um, but that's something to think about. We do have a number of files now which are using data from 2009 to 2021. So pretty recent data that's quite useful to have. You want to look at the operational schedules for each of the systems you're modeling. Uh, don't just take uh, any schedule, even if it's from a, the NCC or whatever. If your particular building happens to be designed to run for longer hours or different hours, uh, you should make those changes and test them and see how that works. For things like heating, you do want to look at the uh, energy that might be used to heat up a boiler loop uh, because that might add quite substantially to the predicted energy use. You need to put that into the model so that you get better outcomes. And you should always remember that a simulation is a kind of idealized operation. It doesn't, you really can't do a simulation for a broken system or when the control system fails or whatever. You have to do another run where you turn off certain control modules to replicate what is a, a, a faulty um, system, okay? We do look at, scenarios and off-axis scenarios for that. So that's what it's coming to. If you want to test the robustness of your model, you do want to do a think about your system. What are the major failure scenarios that the system could have that would really affect your um, energy use? Try and do that. Uh, typically, whenever we are doing an IDR, we will look at the system type and uh, think of what are the most common failure scenarios and then ask that a couple of those be tested for a few months. And that will allow us to see how robust um, the model is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spoke about weather files. Uh, we are getting new weather files, as I said, and it's probably good to try and use those rather than older um, files. And then one knows that certain things are very difficult to model correctly. So if there are things like that, you do want to keep a little bit of energy in your back pocket for as buffers for, for these kinds of things. You aren't really trying to predict um, things down to the nth degree, but you are trying to predict a really robust um, model where it can take care of <clears throat> common failure scenarios and still uh, yep. allow you to meet your neighbor's rating. Anything you want to say on this, yes? Yeah, I think just to, to highlight the aspect with regard to the idealized operation, 
uh, and, uh, and and what makes a model robust? Now, in terms of how, you know, I would say that there are three major ingredients that can really impact hmm. the output of the model. Number one is how well does the energy simulator understand the limitation of the simulation software? That's number one. So each software has got its own limitations in certain areas. Uh, and energy models modelers will tell you that. You know, if you are using, for example, IES or Design Builder or any, any other simulation software, each, each software provider have, have got their sweet spots and their uh, spots where you know there is a weak link. Understanding that is of primary importance. Second uh, aspect is understanding the actual system itself, how good a grasp one has on the HVAC system, its operation. So understanding the limitation of the HVAC system operation as we mentioned earlier, okay, and how well has that been represented? So understanding the limitation of the simulation software, understanding the limitation of the system itself that is being represented, and understanding of the neighbors too as well. You know, how well does one understand the neighbor's tool itself? In And a classic example is that you may be estimating, uh, predicting a particular performance based on, uh, you know, a certain shared services. What if there is no metering there? If there is no metering to account for it, your modeling predictions goes, to the, goes for a toss. So making sure there is consistency in, uh, in all these aspects related to uh, the energy modeling, uh, you know, it impacts the performance and the prediction. And how well have you understood the, the operation, the building into the future, obviously. So these are things that can, uh, that will need to be considered. That's what I want to add, PC. Thanks. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all we wanted to say. We're happy to take any questions yeah. if you want to deal with any of these issues in more detail. I will yeah. come out of my um, presentation mode and I'll stop sharing the screen. Yeah, that'd be for you can Q and A. Can do. Thanks, PC. So, uh, yeah, as a reminder, please uh, use the Q and A function if you'd like to ask any questions as we get into the Q and A section of the webinar now. Uh, so one of the first questions is uh, relating to uh, your slides in relation to component representation and uh, when looking at HVAC systems and how does using uh, full load versus part load data affect the final results um, when you're looking at determining the modeling? Yeah, they do quite a bit. Um... There is a um, there's a lecture that I put out. I'll try and see if I can find you a link for that, where we were looking at, you know, in in Australian cities, what is the uh, how does the cooling demand or the heating demand vary across a year? And what we find is that. Australia in particular, because we are, you know, we're sort of designated a moderate climate. In most of the metropolitan cities in Australia, there is quite a lot of um, variation across the year for the thermal demand of a building. And what is really surprising, well, it shouldn't be, but uh, what comes through very clearly is that there's a large percentage of time when your system is traveling at a very low part load fraction, okay? Um, I'm just putting a link to that. We did a, um, we did a lecture at uh, the future of HVAC recently, and we looked exactly at that. And what we found was that in Sydney, more than a thousand hours were done with uh, an installed capacity, which was less than 10% of the installed capacity, right? So your 
cooling systems are traveling for a long time at very low very low plant capacities and the part load efficiency at those times is very critical if you need to have two pumps running for example that's a lot of pumping power when you are at very low part loads so those kind of things really do impact uh, what's going on Great. Um, thanks, PC. We'll go on to the next question. Next question is from Nick. Um, where can you obtain uh, data set sources for 2009 to 2021 weather data sources? What are the best sources you can use for that? Okay. I will try and uh, put a link in the chat. Um, there is a, a Dr. D Drew Crawley um, and Dr. Linda... I've forgotten her last name now. They were uh, they were quite involved in the development of Energy Plus, and they've been doing weather data for years. And they have put out a website which actually gives you access to free weather data built from satellites. Uh, let me see if I can give you that. Uh, How do I how do I put this into the chat? Um, do we I... should be able to follow we should be able to follow um up okay. with um yeah. the data source after the webinar. So okay, um, we can we'll send you after yep. this. Yeah. Um, we'll go into the next question. Is uh is there a way to customize the simulation outputs to align with meter grouping in the actual building. Uh, yes, there is. Um, yeah, actually, absolutely. that's one of the, yeah. GS, you want to answer that? You were pretty much good. No, on no, it. it's it's just that uh, you know, in terms of there's two levels, essentially two levels of metering that is required. One is, of course, the minimum level of metering to ensure that a neighbor's rating can be can be established. That's 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 of course a uh, there's no is non-negotiable. The other set of meters that you require is what we call the other sub-metering, is to ensure that when you come up with an energy simulation model, you're going to predict how much your chillers are going to do, how much your HUs, your fans, your pumps. So the meet the sub-metering has to be consistent with that, with that aspect, so that you can compare what is predicted to what the actual performance is. And again, this is also one of the aspects that can slip through the cracks, uh, which we have seen from our experience where um, you know, the modeling is done, but then the most important aspect of, of, of monitoring during the post-commissioning phase cannot be done properly if there is no sub-metering that will reflect the the subsystems that are shown in the energy simulation model. So your chill energy use is X, your uh, pumps is Y. So the kilowatt hours for each of those subsystems needs to be monitored at the end, end use level. And you need to have individual submeters to ensure this can happen. Sometimes you may not need, you may not need exactly the same number of meters. You can have virtual meters to add and subtract to get it. But as long as there is a proper submetering regime that can actually quantify the performance and compare it against the actual predicted values, that's what you're looking for. And, and, and essentially someone to do that monitoring and compare that and provide a report every two weeks or every month so that the neighbor's performance and the predicted performance is on track. And if any of the subsystems, the energy use, is higher than predicted, then corrective action could be taken in terms of what needs to be done. Thanks, GS. Uh, so um, next question is um, acknowledging that we should be electrifying buildings. Um, uh, what is the preferred method going forward for <clears throat> accounting for gas services in 
um, future building simulations going forward? Um, so it's the boiler models are, you know, quite mature. They've been around for a while, and there's really um, there's less of a variation in terms of efficiency and part load ratios when you're talking about gas boilers. Heat pumps, of course, are quite a different thing. They are like chillers, so you need to get part load data for them operating both in their cooling mode and in their heating mode. There's also, you got to be aware, I think, that um, when you talk about heat pumps, an air-cooled heat pump uh, is very much like an air-cooled chiller, and it's quite difficult to get huge um, COPs in practice, okay? Uh, if you look at the way, uh, and in, it's there in that presentation um, that we did, you'll find that, actually it isn't, we're doing a separate one for heating, but what you'll find from most of your models, if you've done models, you'll all have seen it, that you get a big spike of heating right in the morning when you switch on the heating system or the air conditioning system in winter. And then within an hour, the demand drops very significantly. So when you have, um, when you have, you know, that kind of operation, the most amount of energy is consumed when the, uh, the heat pump is working at its kind of lower part of the COP curve. That's when the ambient temperature is lowest, the demand is the highest, uh, but it's only there for a every day, a couple of hours in the morning, and then your demand drops off. So I think we're still learning from that. I don't think we've got uh, enough information to give you definitive yeah, answers. And then, to add to that, to add to that, there is, yeah, and to add to that, there is also another aspect that needs to be considered is the defrost cycles for heat pumps. So when it goes on defrost, it's consuming energy, but it's not doing any heating. So, so that's something that will need to be considered as well. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, what is the best way to account for missing drawings, schematics, and other information related to the building? For example, uh, what if a decision regarding to submetering installations is still under consideration and hence to marked up a uh, single line diagram is not available? Um, how do you uh, account for those kinds of um, situations? Uh, GS, you want to tackle that? You do a lot of that. <laughs> no, no, look, I mean, you know, the thing is the, uh, so is this, uh, is this question relating to a practical neighbor assessment or is it related to a simulation? question i'm just trying to it's, if it is uh, related to your neighbors what is that question actually how does it read right ah uh, it's talking about the fact that if you don't have a fully developed uh, single line diagram with metering involved and typically you know when that yeah. happens it is you're telling the design team that you need to have this function in place by the time the building starts to operate, you have to be able to have the data so that when a neighbor's assessor comes, it's easy for him to yep. collect the data, right? He's going to take the, the um, everybody takes the path of least resistance. If you do not have enough submetering data for him to be able to exclude energy consumption correctly as per the neighbor's rules, he will not he or she will not. And yep. that's not their fault. So um, you and are... that's true for shared services as well. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true for shared services as well. So metering aspect is, uh, you know, is very critical and ensuring it is implemented early in the design phase is, uh, you know, is, is very important. But at the last minute, it's hard to put the additional metering. So, I would say that it is it is probably uh, the the onus is really on the person doing energy model to ensure that there is adequate metering so that it can be quantified 
they, you know, to match the predictions. So, so really, an ideal metering uh, energy simulation report would also list in a separate appendix what metering is required to ensure that the building's neighbor's energy performance or uh, estimate is not compromised. I want to say thank you to Noni and a couple of other guys, Sergi, who have put the link for that climate1building.org. And also I'd refer to Mark Dewsbury's comment to be aware of the intricacies of climate data sets. He is right. Um, some of them are built on satellite readings. And that's okay uh, to some extent because there mm -hmm. have been correlations between them, but you need to be aware of you know, what is possible and what is not. The best way to do that, obviously, is to try two or three climate files, to try two or three um, uh, control scenarios to see how far your energy consumptions move. And that gives you an idea of the robustness of your energy model and how it might perform in real life. Typically, one of the things to kind of note is that when you are doing a neighbor's model, you're not you're you're doing something completely different from a compliance model. A compliance model, like for the NCC or for Green Star or for Leeds or anything in, in for that matter, is you're trying to show that the model can get across a line. You know, if the limit is hundred megajoules per meter squared per year, then that's what you're trying to get the model to do using as best inputs as you can. When you're doing a neighbor's model, it's a risk management model. So you're trying to say something like, well, if, you know, what all can go wrong and I can still make my neighbor's energy consumption targets. So that's a different attitude that you are taking for that model. There you are kind of saying, okay, you know, each of your assumptions, is this realistic? Is this practical? Can this happen? You're trying to think about what are the things that can go wrong in your selection of equipment, configurations of air conditioning systems, type of control strategies that you are using, and trying to say, well, uh, I need to be quite confident that the systems will work like this, and even if the weather is, you know, a really cold year or a really hot year or whatever, you might, you will still make your neighbor's rating. If your neighbor's rating is very dependent upon having a PV system produce 60 or 70 percent of its capacity, you have to make sure that that does happen because if it doesn't, you will lose your neighbor's rating. So those are the things that you want to think about as well. Thanks, Pace. And um, someone has asked, um, do you have any recommendations on the best simulation tools that we can use for energy modeling? And uh, of the ones um, that are available, what are the what are ones that you know of that are available online? <laughs> Probably not a question I should answer because I've got some interest in one of the tools myself. Uh, there are only about a handful of energy simulation tools that can do whole building energy simulation. Uh, the one that I use is Design Builder that has got Energy Plus as the energy simulation tool. Energy Plus is devised by, uh, maintained and developed by the US Department of Energy. The code is open source, available on GitHub. So um, there's a lot of PhD theses and master's theses and so on. But there are others who use IES. Um, there's something called Trinsys. Uh, there's, there's a few others I would know, but I think mainly in Australia, we can see IES or Design Builder as the two tools that are available. Others can probably tell you where to get IES, but Design Builder is pretty much available online. Great. Um, I think we've covered all the main questions that are coming through um, that relate to the content. Um, just like to extend 
A thank you to everyone who, who's um, posted links in the Q&A um, has really helped um, share um, and uh, provide answers as well as supporting answers um, for PC. So thanks Noni and um, Mark for and uh, Sergey for sharing your responses in the question and answer um, as well to help everyone. Um, and yeah, thank you both to PC and GS for joining us. Um, just maybe give one or two minutes extra <clears throat> to see if there's any more questions, but um, following this, uh, we'll be uh, sharing the recorded session on our YouTube channel and we'll also be sharing uh, and letting everyone, everyone know uh, when it's available. So um, that's when you can expect to receive um, a recording of this presentation. And I'd just like to say one big thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, really great to uh, have you yeah, on board for this session. So I'd just like to wrap it up and say thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. All the best. Thank you.